Right, we're in the final, final furlong. Um, I'd now like to invite Terry Plank, our Wilson medalist, to come and give her talk at the speed of volcanic eruptions. Terry, Thank you. the floor is yours. I'm now between tea and drinks. This is kind of a strange position to be in, so hopefully this will be a, um, swift and interesting. Um, all right, so uh, we're all thinking about Fuego, the volcano in Guatemala that uh, erupted last weekend. This is kind of what it looks like right now. Um, uh, many people have died, and there are thousands of people have been evacuated. It's not over. There were pyroclastic flows yesterday. Um, so it's quite scary, and it's something of a tragedy. This is uh, Fuego in 1974. So as of now, I believe this is still a larger eruption in 74. This was a uh, magnitude 4 on the volcanic explosivity index scale, a subplinian eruption. But during this eruption, there was a geologist. He was actually from Brooklyn, New York, but he worked for the Geophysical Institute in, in Guatemala. His name was Sam Bonas. He went out every day of this eruption as close as he dared and collected the largest class and then went kilometers away and put sheets on the ground and collected ash that normally gets blown away, the fine ash. And he went back and did that every day of the eruption. It's quite an unprecedented sample set. And it's benefited so many of us who've worked on uh, volcanoes and volcanic arcs. And in reflecting on this talk, it occurred to me that Fuego has been something of a touchstone volcano through my career, so it's actually going to frame my talk. So Fuego is actually geochemically interesting. Um, this is something that, geez, I thought about back in my thesis. If we look at the chemical composition of arc volcanoes, their barium concentration, their sodium concentration, Fuego belongs with Guatemala in this anomalously enriched barium field. The volcanoes there, for some reason, are enriched in barium. And uh, a light bulb went off at one point thinking, well, the sediments that are subducting there are also enriched in barium. It's the eastern equatorial Pacific. There's high biological productivity and barite. And so uh, we kind of connected the dots between the flux of chemicals going into subduction zones in sediments and the flavor, the geochemical flavor of the volcanics that come out. And Fuego was a part of that, kind of anchoring the high end here at Guatemala is the the barium enriched end member, but that uh, this diagram shows that uh, arcs are what they eat. Um, through the subduction <laughs> process, uh, we think of this as recycling, uh, that material in the outer part of the planet, notably sediments on the seafloor, gets subducted, where they uh, dehydrate, they're, they're getting heated up and squeezed, they dehydrate, they melt, and they transfer these chemical components into the overlying mantle region drive melting, the melts rise and erupt out the volcanoes. So that's the kind of cycle that we think about. And uh, we as a geological community have done a pretty good job tracing most of the periodic table through subduction zones. And yet back at this time in kind of the 90s, I really had yearned to trace one chemical species in particular, and that is water. Water is the medium through this whole process. It's the water that comes out of the subducting sediments. It's the water that drives melting in the mantle. And it's water that drives the explosive eruption at the surface. The problem is it's very hard to measure water in volcanic rocks because they degas. They're full of holes. That's where the water used to be. It's not there anymore to measure. And so it's been very difficult to understand how much water is dissolved in magmas before they erupt. Um, the, the uh, only bits of magma that have not degassed their water uh, appear to be trapped inside crystals. So these little droplets of melt, we call them melt inclusions, inside crystals. If the crystals formed under pressure and kept the melt inclusion under pressure, ideally it trapped the melt uh, before it degassed its water. And we can go in there. It's now quenched as a glass. We can measure water in the glass. And, um, the paper that really was so compelling in this was, uh, was one I actually got to review. It's a lesson that you like, should say yes to reviewing papers every now and again. This, this, reviewing this paper really changed the path of my career for the second time. Um, and this was Sisson and Lane. And they were not the first to point out how important melt inclusions are. That I credit uh, in subduction processes. I credit Fred Anderson for that. But they were the first to uh, measure with the ion microprobe undisputably high water concentrations, up to six weight percent. Water is a major element in magmas. 
and it correlates with something else sensibly, like sulfur. And so this just triggered all sorts of questions for those of us working on subduction zones. Do certain subduction zones input more water into the mantle? Do certain arc volcanoes, are they wetter than others? And how does this affect eruption? Several of us literally dropped what we were doing and started working on these melt inclusions, which are not easy. So let's look at them uh, in a little more detail. Um, the previous speaker talked about uh, tomography. This is actually a micro CT scan of an olivine crystal. It's spinning around, and we're going to look inside it and see what it holds. It's going to have all sorts of inclusions inside it. Um, right now, we're going to cut into it. There's tubes of melt, which I'll talk about later. And then here are the inclusions are highlighted in this kind of orange color. And now we're going to watch two of these little bits of frozen magma dance around each other. And in fact, they have exolved a CO2 bubble in this inclusion. That's what the blue dot is. It's a little bit of uh, CO2 that's also in the, in the melt inclusion. These are chromite crystals for the petrologists in the room. In, in yellow, those are chromite crystals. And then we go back out to the olivine. And these are plagioclase feldspar crystals. And when we finish the animation, you'll see it's just covered in glass. From the beginning, it looks like a lump of coal. You would never really guess all of those things are inside the olivine crystal. So we work very hard to look for these things. And I really credit the fantastic students and postdocs who have spent hours and hours and hours in front of a microscope looking for these little melt inclusions and then studying them in various uh, compelling ways. Um, it, the field was so wide open when we started working on this that my students just picked entire subduction zones. Katie Kelly worked on the Marianas. And, Jen Wade took South America, Mindy took the Aleutians, and Lauren took Tonga. And we just kind of spread out around the world measuring water in, in uh, magmas just to see what we would find, honestly. And um, what we found was somewhat surprising. What we found was that the water content varied in a very narrow range, much more than we had expected, from volcano to volcano and particularly arc to arc. So this is the maximum water. That would be like the initial water before the volcanoes degassed. And uh, these are for seven different subduction zones. Each one of these is a volcano. In orange are the ones that came from our work. And what you can see is the averages in the blue boxes are nearly identical for all of these arcs. That is, four plus or minus one weight percent water is the initial water content. Um, if we plot these individual data points as a histogram, you'll see there's a very strong mean for these 57 volcanoes from different arcs at around four plus or minus one. It was so interesting. We wrote a paper on this, and you can read it. We don't really have the answer to the question. We present two answers to the question. But for our purposes today, um, it's kind of a conundrum. If mafic magmas have such similar water contents, what drives this huge diversity of eruptive behavior? Water is the fuel for the eruption. And if it's this constant, what is driving a diversity in eruptive style? We can see this even from Fuego. The 74 eruption was horrendous. It was a VEI-4. In 2002, Fuego erupted more, it was still explosively, but much less so. In fact, uh, this is an order of magnitude scale, so 100 times less intense of an eruption. And yet the magma type is the same, and the driving initial water content is the same. Um, what the textbook teaches us, that it's the viscosity of the magma and the driving gas fuel that controls explosivity, that really can't be the whole story. These are pretty much driven by the same initial magma. So what, is a, what, what, what we've been working on, and others have too, is another driving parameter. And that is the rate term. And uh, this is intuitive if you think about a soda bottle. Um, a soda bottle is a good analogy for a volcanic eruption. The CO2 is initially dissolved in the water when the cap is on under pressure. When you release the cap, the CO2 solubility drops. The water exolves into vapor. It rises buoyantly and flings some of the liquid out of the soda bottle. That's, what a volcanic eruption does, except water is the driving gas in most cases. But how do you suppress an eruption? Someone shakes it up and hands you the bottle. What do you do? You open it very slowly, right? You let the gas out. So there's got to be a very important rate term in this. And that's what we've been working on. So the rate term is not the cap on the bottle. It's how fast the magma rises, because it's under pressure at depth, and it lowers its pressure as it rises. So we're either talking about the decompression rate or the rise rate of the magma. So under high ascent, um, the magma is rising fast and brings the bubbles with it. Under low ascent, the magma is rising very slowly. The bubbles uh, escape ahead of the magma, like 
the glass of beer that we're going to be drinking in an hour, sitting, well, sorry, 10 minutes, that's going to be there. <laughs> wine, maybe it was bubbly wine. Um, so it leads to these different uh, phenomena that the bubbles will segregate, they will coalesce and segregate even faster, and we lose the gas, the driving fuel. So that's kind of the intuitive reason why decompression rate matters, but there's a host of kinetically controlled phenomena that depend on the decompression rate. How, how many bubbles nucleate? Uh, if there's shear heating, if there's enough strain rate that it breaks brittily, uh, if the magma crystallizes or not, and what size crystals it crystallizes. And then volatile diffusion itself, the water actually has to get from dissolved in the melt into the bubble. And that's what we're going to exploit next as a clock. So the time it takes for the, the water to diffuse into the bubble, we can measure. And it's also a measure of the rate of uh, decompression. So how are we going to do this? We're going to look for a very specific kind of inclusion, one that's actually open. So this is a, a tube of melt. We'll call it an embayment in an olivine crystal, and there's a bubble at the outlet. And so this melt is an equilibrium, let's say, with the melt around it at depth. Everything has 4% water. And then the system starts to decompress. And what happens is the exterior magma vesiculates. The water goes out into the bubbles. But in the, in the embayment, the only choice it has, unless it has a bubble and we choose ones that don't in the inside, the only choice it has is to diffuse water into the nearest bubble, which is at its outlet. And so if that happens fast enough, we can catch the water diffusing and measure a chemical profile and know the rate of decompression. And so it might work something like this. Uh, this would be the initial water content at depth in, the, in that melt tube from its interior to its exterior. And then the system starts to decompress. A few minutes, another five minutes, six minutes. You can see the tube is lagging behind and will develop a chemical profile depending upon how fast it's ascending. Nine minutes, 10 minutes, okay. And if we go after it erupts, it quenches, we measure the profile. If it looks like this, we'd say, okay, well, it took about nine minutes to ascend from 10 kilometers depth when it last had 4% water. Uh, we didn't invent this technique. Fred Anderson, again, was the first to write about it. And uh, John Blundy and, and some Bristol colleagues uh, wrote about this for Mount St. Helens. But we were the first to use the nanosims, where we could measure multiple volatile species, water, CO2, and sulfur at the same time, which give us multiple clocks. And that was Eric Howry's innovation, my collaborator for more than 15 years in this project. <laughs> He's the analytical muscle behind the melt inclusions and the embayments. Um, and so here are some of the data that we've collected, again, for Fuego. Oh, geez, I forgot to talk. Tom Sisson's paper that I reviewed was on Fuego, 1974. So these same samples that Sam Bonas collected keep popping up over and over. Um, Fuego initially had 4% water, but a melt tube now has dropped to 3. We think the inside has dropped and that this is the diffusion profile going out to the exterior. We see another profile in sulfur that looks like this. Uh, we think that sulfur, the, the, the initial is here, and only this part represents diffusion. And that makes sense because sulfur diffuses orders of magnitude more slowly than water. So this gives us two independent clocks. And we developed a numerical model that looks at the diffusivity as a function of decompression. The diffusivity of all these species are dependent on water itself, so it's a tricky model. But you can see that uh, 1.28 megapascals per second is too fast, and 0.08 is too slow. But 0.32 is just right, both for water and for sulfur. And so that gives us a decompression rate. 0.32 megapascals per second is the equivalent of 10 meters a second. It's 40 kilometers an hour. It's a freight train. OK, so it's the magma moving kilometers per hour to the surface. We're talking 10 minutes to move from 7 kilometers depth. That's an explosive eruption. That's Fuego 1974. We're also looking at other less explosive <coughs> eruptions. Here's Seaguam in the Aleutians, a VEI-1 fire fountain. We've plucked embayments from that eruption. And it does indeed reflect lower rates of decompression, which makes sense. It's a less uh, energetic eruption. Maybe the gas has segregated some of it. Um, and so this is going in the right direction. Uh, these are all five data points that exist so far. Decompression rate versus VEI. So you just saw Seaguam. You saw Fuego. We've done work on Kilauea even. And then this is the Bristol Group's data on Mount St. Helens. Um, I'm, uh, uh, not quite prepared to say this is a fantastic correlation until we have more data, but it looks, uh, it looks pretty good so far. 
that the decompression rate scales with VEI certainly better than something like the initial volatile content. Um, so I'm working, we're working with Helga Gonerman on developing conduit models to explain this. Okay, so for the last bit about this talk, I want to show you about the new things that we're doing to try to actually populate this diagram. These embayments are impossible to find. And uh, I have to talk my students into searching through bags of tephra to find these embayments, whereas crystals are common. And crystals have uh, water dissolved in them, even clinopyroxene, which is a crystal that doesn't normally have water in its structure. Water exists in a defect. Uh, we've measured its diffusivity in the laboratory. It's quite fast. Um, and maybe we can watch the crystal itself leak its water, just like the embayment, but easier to measure. We can put a big SIM spot here and measure the water profile. And uh, indeed, we found there to be profiles of dropping water content uh, from the ion probe data that are consistent with the pyroxene losing its water as it rises towards the surface and that if we know the diffusivity, uh, which again, we've measured in the laboratory, then uh, we know the rate, again, which is very similar, nearly identical to the embayment rate and gives us uh, a ground truth uh, experiment here using, again, Fuego 1974 pyroxene. We just came back from a uh, facility a few weeks ago where we measured by infrared spectroscopy this whole corner of this crystal in 10 minutes and we're able to map the water zonation in the crystal. So we're quite optimistic now that we can make quick measurements that actually have better spatial resolution than the ion probe um, and that indeed every crystal can be a clock. We've measured water also in olivine at the parts per million level. Every olivine so far that we've measured is also zoned in water, showing it's leaking on the way to the surface. If we know its diffusivity, we can use it as a clock too. We've talked about time here in this room. This is the short, and we're geologists, this is about the shortest clock you could imagine. We're measuring rates of minutes to hours, which is quite pertinent to volcanic eruptions, evidently. Crystal clocks has been something of a hot topic here for the past 10 years, so we've just extended that to perhaps the fastest volatile species in crystals, water. All right, uh, the final innovation here comes from uh, Megan Newcomb, who's a postdoc working with me, uh, and she developed a technique to look at a cooling rate, okay, so we can put a cooling rate to the decompression rate. She's looking inside melt inclusions, doing transects on the microprobe to look at how they're chemically zoned in elements just like magnesium. And this zonation now reflects crystallization of olivine on the rims, which has to be a cooling phenomenon. And so from this, she gets a cooling rate, how much olivine we could possibly grow in a little boundary layer that then magnesium gets a chance to diffuse and feed that growth along the rims. And she comes up with cooling rates that are on the order of 40 degrees C in seven minutes. That's during the decompression event. We're cooling 40 minutes during decompression. Too fast for conductive cooling that has to be actually adiabatic cooling of a gas phase, okay? And so what we're looking at is the volume of vapor ex increasing and expanding and adiabatically cooling the system 40 degrees as the magma is ascending seven kilometers in 10 minutes. <coughs> okay, so this is kind of the future. We're looking at the PTT path of a magma. There's only a few magmas on Earth where we have these constraints. One of them is Fuego 1974. We know it came from seven kilometers depth in seven to 10 minutes it cooled and it, how much water it initially had in it. It's its vital signs. I think it's quite important, even though this is probably too short as a warning sign, 10 minutes, but it's telling us what the system was doing before the eruption. Much like it's important to know if someone's having a tacky heartbeat or chest pains and how bad their heart attack is going to be. Okay, that's what this is useful for. But clearly it'd be useful to monitor uh, their blood pressure and cholesterol, and that's why it's so vital to do monitoring as well on the time scale of weeks. And this is very exciting data that Marie Edmonds knows all about and has partly developed, looking at gases that come out volcanoes. So this is showing the CO2 sulfur ratio, and this will come again, the CO2 sulfur ratio bouncing around, and then what you're gonna see, it's gonna start over again. Believe me, this is Torrealba volcano. The background is eye candy, so it's not the same time as these uh, two years. So this is CO2 sulfur bouncing around. It rises and then the volcano erupts, bounces around, and it rises two weeks before the eruption and the volcano erupts. So this is actually a very useful warning sign. It's weeks, um, it's telling you there's magma moving, that's why the CO2 rises. Um, 
So for Fuego, there is one, uh, that I understand, scanning DOAS that's looking at sulfur, and that sulfur has been rising through the past few months. I don't think it led to directly an evacuation, and as far as I know, it's very difficult to measure CO2 in Fuego. We really need other remote means to do that. Um, also, I don't know if at Fuego right now, there's a SAM bonus running around collecting samples. I don't know, and I understand there's much more con serious concerns than picking up samples. But on the other hand, just like knowing the vital signs, doing forensics, you do want to arrive at the crime scene not too late. And so this is a passion of mine, is making sure samples get collected after eruptions. Here's an eruption in Alaska. What happens if a volcano erupts and no one's there? Okay, you might not care, but 50,000 people a day fly over Alaska airspace, and so care a lot about what the volcanoes of Alaska do. And in fact, there was a town this is a beautiful satellite image of a volcanic plume going right over the settlement of Nelson Lagoon, a fairly hard scrabble town out there of fishermen. Um, they posted on Facebook pictures the next day of their cars and roofs covered in ash. Um, some folks at the Alaska Volcano Observatory friended them and the next day they filled up a trash can for us of this ash. And we wanted to know how to get it, and they said, well, the next supply boat's coming in a couple weeks. We'd really love some fruit. And so, <laughs> so we requisitioned a box of produce in exchange for ash. But I know, again, there's been a lot of citizen science ash collection around Fuego, and we need to do this because we need to know what was inside the patient you know, before the event happened and tell the stories that the crystals have to tell about how magma raced to the surface before eruption. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Fantastic. Questions? Dan? You've shown that the, the water is really quite diffusive along here. Yeah. And the sulfur isn't. Yes. Why do they correlate? Um, they correlate in melt inclusions that have been trapped at depth, so the, the enclosed melt inclusions that have been trapped at depth and risen rapidly to the surface. They actually preserve their initial water and sulfur because in order to diffuse through the, in order to diffuse 4% water through the olivine, it's not just the diffusivity, it's the partitioning. And you can partition so little water into olivine, it's like having a very small wheelbarrow. You've got to move a ton through the crystal. So the fully enclosed melt inclusions can actually retain most of their water if the magma zips to the surface. What I showed were open inclusions. They were actually open to the exterior. And there we lost both water and sulfur. But Eric, looking at uh, melt inclusions in, in, in Iceland, found that wasn't the case, that the water was the one thing which did diffuse out of the melt inclusions. No, I, I totally agree. Water is the only species that diffuses through the melt inclusion, but it doesn't have to if the magma rises rapidly enough. In 10 minutes, it's not enough time to lose more than a few percent of the water. And so what Tom Sisson found was a correlation between water and sulfur because those had been faithfully recorded. But magmas that rise slowly, absolutely, they're going to lose some water through the olivine. And that's another clock you can use. Uh, we've looked at melt inclusions of different size and you can see that they've leaked different extents uh, through diffusion through the olivine. But right, sulfur, CO2, and chlorine and fluorine don't, don't really enter the, well, fluorine does, but enter the olivine to any extensive amount. Peter. As you see in those changes in volatiles, is that reflected in the seismic properties which you could measure through that material at the same time? Um, so absolutely, the gas data I showed, the CO2 sulfur, rising a few weeks before the eruption. That's been shown at several volcanoes, notably Etna, to coincide with deep seismic swarms or seismic activity. Right, but those are again probably on longer time scales. I think those, those kind of changes in VPVS or through the ambient noise tomography, that's been like over weeks or months. And that's certainly like a recharge event but what I'm showing is kind of the last event of how fast magmas move to the surface. And there might be other seismic tools I don't know that much about or infrasound or something that tells us how fast material is moving through the conduit. I'd like to learn more about that. Yeah, it's a problem with uh, uh, also for the 
Yes, right. The glass yeah, beads. The question we all Yep. How come you don't freeze the melting fusion? You do. I mean, the cooling rates, are, again, are 40 degrees in 10 minutes. And then after that, it is quenched to the glass transition. Yeah, then it's, then it's through the glass transition. So it's only you know, tens of minutes of olivine growth before it's quenched. So it, these are quenched oh, quite a bit. because of the olivine growth at the same time. That, that's right. Oh, yeah. OK. Yeah. growth rate. Right, but it effectively, the glass transition temperature is where the diffusion rate slows so much that you freeze the system in, so, yes. We did compare cooling and water loss in looking at bombs that were six centimeters, and we figured they would cool in 10 minutes, and indeed that was enough time for them to lose some water. So you can kind of compare the cooling times and water diffusion times. They operate over similar time scales for some you problems. Also put water back into the oven. Um, during hydration, yes. No, even in and Oh yeah, they get entrained if they get entrained in a magma that has higher water content, absolutely. Okay. But the last thing that's gonna happen is dehydration. So they always show a dehydration path as they've ascended. Yeah, back. In relation to the gas monitoring, can you foresee any innovations in the future or put a different way? I'm not the right person to ask. I wish that, you know, Marie Edmonds is, is, you should have a chat with her over, uh, okay. over wine. There's a lot of innovations. I personally think that's like, if I were going to drop everything right now and do something else, I'd be looking at gas. And because is there a wish list you would have in terms of, you know, how to monitor or sample density or... It, you know, time series like that are amazing, right? The multi-gas, that was multi-gas data it requires putting a box up on the plume and you're collecting data almost every second, right? And so that's, that's tremendous and you can do it autonomously and you can telemeter it. So that's, that's great. Um, it doesn't work for things like Fuego, which blow up. And they're too dangerous to put a box up in the, in the plume. So we need remote vehicles. Um, and getting uh, carbon isotopes is really difficult too. That's on my wish list of what we can look at with carbon isotopes. It might tell us whether you're subducting you know, the carbonate or organic carbon and how that's affecting the CO2 cycle. And that's also difficult to measure and requires taking, taking uh, samples. Yeah. Okay. David. If you take us to the exclusive world, what, what lessons can we learn? How can we introduce what you've done here for an, intrusive, an intrusion, say a, a thick sill? Yeah, it's much more limited because the water's so furtive that in the time that sills cool, you know, you could easily lose water from the system. And even lava flows lose water in the time it takes a lava flow to cool. We've looked at pyroxenes and melt inclusions in lava flows and they've lost their water. So water's tricky, but you can look at still CO2 and sulfur because, again, they don't diffuse through the olivine. And if there's melt inclusions in either lavas or sills, they should still record their initial CO2 and sulfur. And that's quite interesting from a climate point of view. But water's tricky. You really need well-quenched products. And those are volcanic products. And so, you know, we haven't had a great way to figure out how to extract this from the plutonic record. That's why it's taken so long to really measure the water content of magmas. Just one last question. No, no, that's fine. Terry, thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank lecture. you so Enjoy much. It.